We begin Hespero Savage by pulling the boss mid. Decolation is a standard raid wide which deals massive damage, demanding mitigation. Bloodrake will target either all DPS or all tanks and healers, with a tether that deals massive damage at the end of the cast. This is followed by Etheric Clamus and a second Bloodrake, and each Bloodrake cast makes players weak to an upcoming mechanic. The first Bloodrake makes the targeted roll weak to tethers, while the second Bloodrake makes players weak to roll call. In other words, the players not hit by the first Bloodrake must resolve the upcoming tether mechanic, while the players not hit by the second Bloodrake must resolve the roll call mechanic. These blood rakes can hit the same roll back to back, or can alternate, dictating how exactly we resolve the upcoming mechanics. To help players keep track of which roll handles which mechanics, I made a macro that relays in party chat who is responsible for what, and I highly recommend this while progging. After the two blood rakes, Asparus will cast Directors Balone, inflicting one tank, one healer, and two DPS with roll call. Roll Call is a debuff that does nothing, so long as the players it resolves on are not weak to it. Furthermore, a player without Roll Call, standing near a player that has it, will cause Roll Call to jump to the unaffected player, and place Miscast on the player it left, immunizing them to Roll Call for the rest of the mechanic. Essentially, once you pass Roll Call to another player, you cannot pick it back up. This is followed by Inversive Clamus, tethering four players that will be struck by Circle AoEs at the end of the cast. We resolve this mechanic in a very calculated manner that minimizes movement and keeps the entire party in melee range. Let's walk through two scenarios. Scenario A involves one role needing tethers, in this case tanks and healers, and the other role needing roll call, in this case the DPS. We start by having the tanks and healers, who need to get rid of roll call, stack south, either in the boss's hitbox if they also need tethers, which they do in this example, or max melee if they don't need tethers. The players that need roll call, the DPS, will loosely spread to avoid accidentally immunizing one another. When the director's balloon cast finishes, since the tanks and healers are stacked, their roll call will auto-pass, leaving two players immune. Taking a tiny step inside the stack helps ensure this immunity happens. From here, the two players that need roll call but don't have it will run into the stack one at a time to pick it up. It's important to do this one at a time, as if two players run into the stack at once they may pass between each other causing one player to become immune, and killing whichever weak player gets stuck with a roll call. After picking up their roll calls, the DPS will stack inside the boss's hitbox if they need tethers, or at max melee if they don't. With this positioning, the tethers will automatically jump to the players that can safely resolve them. Scenario B involves one roll needing both tethers and roll call. In this example, both blood rakes targeted the tanks and healers, so we'll call this DPS need everything. We once again start by having the players that don't want roll call the tanks and healers, stack south. Since the DPS also need the tethers, the tanks and healers will stack max melee. After roll call comes out, the players that need roll call will once again run in one at a time to pick up the debuff, before stacking in the boss's hitbox to pick up the tethers and resolve the mechanic. After another decolation, Hesperus casts Elegant Evisceration, a two-hit AoE tank buster on the main tank that inflicts magic vulnerability up. This can be resolved with an invulnerability cooldown, or with regular cooldowns in a tank swap during the cast. This is followed by setting the scene, during which Hesperos lays an elemental scene on each quadrant of the arena. This doesn't deal any damage, but standing in the wells in the center of each quadrant will deal damage over time and should be avoided. As soon as the scenes are visible, we have the tank immediately pull the boss between water and fire, towards the wall for uptime during an upcoming mechanic. Note that pulling between lightning and fire is viable as well, and some groups take this approach instead. Either option is more or less the same, but pulling to poison is not advised. Following setting the scene, Hesperos will cast Pinax, causing the scenes to begin resolving, indicated by the order they begin erupting. Standing in a resolving quadrant will deal massive damage to the player, and even if they survive, they will also receive a damage down. When lightning resolves, a proximity damage AoE hits the center of the arena. If the bosses move correctly, the party will be safe at max melee range towards the wall. When poison resolves, players need to be spread to avoid overlapping their circle AoEs. When water resolves, an omnidirectional knockback will hit the center of the arena. My groups chose to always immune the water knockback with arm's length and shore cast. Finally, when fire resolves, both healers will be targeted with shared damage stack AoEs. We divided the raid into light parties for this, with one group stacking near the arena's edge, and the other towards the arena's center. While there is a ton of RNG in this mechanic, there are some patterns we can observe. Following the Pinax cast, either water or lightning will begin erupting first, followed by either fire or poison. 
players have only about two seconds to adjust between when the first and second elements resolve. This is followed by either water or lightning erupting, whichever we didn't see earlier, before Asperos jumps mid and begins casting Shift, which we'll go over in a moment. And after a long delay, either fire or poison, whichever didn't resolve earlier, will resolve. Shift is very similar to the normal difficulty encounter. The cast name will tell you Asperos' destination, northerly for north, easterly for east, and so on. However, players must inspect Asperos to determine if he will do a massive knockback from his destination, indicated by a glowing cloak, or a cleave from his destination, telegraphed by a glowing sword. To make orientation easier, after resolving the first two elements I immediately face the north A marker. Once I see the direction in Hesperus' shift cast I immediately begin running in that direction, inspecting whether his cape or sword is glowing on the way. For a cleave, players need to stand on the sides of the destination marker. For knockback, players need to stand directly in front of the destination marker, as the knockback is almost as far as the arena itself, making angles dangerous. Players can knockback immune both the water and the cape here if needed, by using their knockback immunity halfway through the shift cast, but the timing is tight. Just to recap one more time, following Pinax, we resolve either water or lightning, immediately followed by fire or poison. Next, either water or lightning begins erupting, whichever we haven't already seen, before Asperos jumps mid and begins casting shift. We position to resolve shift, which resolves immediately after the third element, and finally position to resolve a delayed fire or poison, whichever we haven't already seen. After Pinax, we have the tank move the boss mid in preparation for an upcoming mechanic. Hesperos will cast another elegant evisceration, followed by a blood rake. This blood rake will tether all party members, as well as three of the four elemental wells. We make a note of the untethered well, poison in this case, as it will be the safe spot for a future mechanic. Hesperos will cast Setting the Scene, once more summoning the elemental quadrants. Vengeful Balone will give all tanks and healers the acting DPS debuff, as well as give 2 DPS acting tank and 2 DPS acting healer. This debuff mandates that you pop at least one of that role's orb for the upcoming orb mechanic, but you'll soon see that these debuffs are irrelevant to us. This is followed by Elemental Balone, giving the entire party elemental resistance down to the elements tethered during the earlier Blood Rake cast. Hesperos will cast yet another Blood Rake on the entire party, followed by Balone Bursts, summoning 8 orbs that tether to nearby players after a delay. Orbs are lethal to the role they are tethered to, and deal high damage in a large explosion that should be shared by two players. They also give stacks of Thrice Come Ruin, killing any player that soaks more than two orbs. My group uses a very specific set of clock positions to resolve this mechanic. We have all melees on Cardinals, with the tanks north and east, and the DPS south and west. We have the ranged all on intercardinals, with the healers southeast and northeast, and the DPS southwest and northwest. When the orbs tether, all of the intercardinal players rotate counterclockwise, giving us four pairs of one melee and one ranged. We then run through to the other side of the boss, with the ranged popping the orbs. We then rotate clockwise to pop the next orb after catching a heal. By resolving the mechanic this way, all of our melee got full uptime while each DPS also soaks one tank and one healer orb, completely resolving the mechanic for everyone, while minimizing movement. After popping the orbs, Hesperos will cast Periok Toy, causing all four scenes to explode. Because of our elemental resistance down, we must stand in the poison tile that wasn't blood raked earlier, taking only massive damage rather than lethal damage. Following Periak Toy, our tank moves the boss a bit north to make the next mechanic easier. Hesperos will blood rake the entire raid once again before casting B-Lone Coils, summoning four roll lock towers. Think of these towers as the first blood rake in the encounter. Whoever soaks these towers will be vulnerable to tethers. Therefore, if tanks and healers soak towers as in this example, then DPS need to resolve the next two tethers. We have the melee soak the two north towers, with the range taking the farther south towers. Hesperos will cast Inverse of Clamus, tethering four players once again and the players not soaking the towers will pick these up before spreading north. The towers and tethers will resolve at the same time. After another etheric clamus and full party blood rake, Hesperos again casts balone coils, summoning four more rollock towers. Think of these towers as the second blood rake we saw at the start. Whoever soaks these towers, DPS in this example, will be weak to roll call. Like at the start of the fight, one roll can be selected to soak both tower sets, making them weak to both tethers and roll call. Hesperos will once again cast Director's Balone, followed by Inverse Glamis Tethers. We resolve these as we did at the start of the fight. Following another decolation and elegant evisceration, we recenter the boss. At this point, Hesperos will cast another Setting the Scene, before going into another Pinax phase that functions the same as the first. 
After Pinax resolves, Asparos casts three more decolations. Players have 10 seconds after the final decolation to drive Asparos below 50% HP. Failing the DPS check will result in a wipe, while meeting it will allow players to spend the remainder of the lockout fighting the final boss.